Martha Burke burst into the national spotlight in an unusual way by grabbing hold of that bright light and shining it on the all-male Augusta Golf Club host of the prestigious Masters. That was back in 2003. You might remember that. It's hard to forget. She's been chair of the National Council of Women's Organizations and is part of too many media ventures to name here. But importantly to us, she is a New Mexican living in Corrales. And she's also author of the book, Your Voice, Your Vote, The Savvy Woman's Guide to Power, Politics, and the Change We Need. Martha Burke, good to see you and welcome to this table. Thank you, good to be here. Yeah, and I have to say congratulations on this book. This is, I, I like how you actually say it, The Savvy Woman's Guide. It's a useful product, you can do things with it, you can take sections of it that you need or don't need. So when you set it up, what were you thinking? How, was, how would you like people to approach this book and use this book? Well any way they want really, depending on what issue they care about. Now we do have chapters in the front that talk about how our government works, give some poll information, what women and men are thinking and how they differ, and that's great background. But when we start getting into the issues, you can read about what you care about and you don't have to read the rest of it. You don't have to plow through everything just to get to the, your issue. This is a, a book for women. This is not something that is a general topic topic issue here. You get really into the weeds on a lot of things, historically especially, to give people a grounding on how to attack things politically. Why did you take that approach? Because there's a lot of tension now with younger folks not really, really hearing some of us older lions about the tactics about what we used back in the 70s and 80s. How right. did you approach that? Well, I heard a young woman say just this past weekend, we don't need any mentoring. And I thought, well, um, take exception with that one. Uh, but what I did was I said, let's look at what people normally do not think of as women's issues mm -hmm. and talk to women and the men that care about the women in their lives about how these things are women's issues. And one example that you and I were talking about just a few minutes ago is how much wars cost. Mm -hmm. The cost of war usually comes out of social programs. Those primarily benefit women and kids. Uh, to just start off with one statistic that's pretty darn shocking, I did the math, we could have had 25 years, that's a whole generation of kids, of child care for every four and five year old in the United States for the cost of the Iraq war for 10 years. That hurts, that hurts. But I would say that's an example of what you can find in this book because you use things like that in a lot of facts and a lot of details, a lot of charting, which is okay. Mm -hmm. um, because it seemed to me if you, let's say you, had a, you were assigned to do something, you, you wanted to learn something, you wanted to bring some information to a meeting, you could literally take this book, set it on a copier and use it as a guide to frame an argument for certain kinds of issues. And again, you cut these out specifically yes. that way. What was, again, the thought I've process I've done it so that. that maybe you're Jean Grant and you're only 29 and you don't care that much about Social Security. You don't have to read that part, but maybe you got a couple of kids and you do want to see where we are on child care. Same thing about, say, women in the military, uh, what happens when uh, military spending goes up and other spending goes down, taxes. People think taxes affect everybody the same. Mm -hmm. They don't. Mm -hmm. They affect people differently depending on who you are. If you're female, you have a little more at stake in tax policy. The economy, the housing meltdown, most people don't know it, but most of those bad mortgages were sold to women. And in some cases we have documented that women of color were targeted for them. So you can read the book in bits and pieces, read what the issues you care about, those you don't care about, save for later. Someday you'll be 49 and you might care about Social Security. <laughs> Maybe not even until, you never know. <laughs> right. Um, one of the interesting things that you did in this book was one of the last chapters was about something that is of critical importance, it would seem to me, and that's equal rights for women in our Constitution. And you and I again had a bit of a, a conversation about how we can look back, some of us at a certain age, at the big fight that, was hap that happened in the 70s where we came up just a little bit short there. Do touch on that a little bit, because as you say in that chapter, most Americans don't know that women are not protected constitutionally. They assume that's part of the Constitution. Right. It's a big deal. So uh, give us a little it background is, on that and where do we go from here It on is this a issue. big deal. Women, are, well, first of all, when the Constitution was written, 
the ones who were equal were white male landowners, mm -hmm. and that was all. Then the 14th Amendment was passed giving constitutional rights to men of color, specifically African-American men, but no women, and there was a big fight over it at the time. But women were left out and told, wait your turn, basically. It's, it's time for the black man, all women, black and white were told, wait your turn. We're still waiting. In the 1980s, there was a push for a constitutional amendment, the Equal Rights Amendment for women. It had to be ratified by 38 states. We only got 35. So a bottom line, Gene, we are not in the Constitution constitutionally protected. And people say, oh, what difference does it make? We have lots of rights in the United States and we don't really need it, it's just symbolic. That is not true. Let's take something like the law against uh, pregnancy discrimination. You cannot be fired for being pregnant, but it is only statutory. It's not a constitutional right that you're equal to men who may, say, have a heart attack and can't be fired for having a medical problem. So every law we have equal credit. You can't be denied a credit card as you once could just because you're female. That can go away with a conservative Congress. Whereas if we had an Equal Rights Amendment, those bedrock principles of equality between the sexes would be guaranteed. Right now they're not. It's rather shocking to think about when you do read that chapter, what you're basically describing here is vulnerability. Yes. All these things are vulnerable to a Congress, a president, or whatever the case may be. It could all go backwards any given whim of the moment. That's not, that's not a way to keep our, our culture moving forward. Well, and speaking mm -hmm. of going backwards, I think we are all aware that we thought mm -hmm. the argument in this country over birth control was settled. Right. Uh, now, I'm not talking abortion. I'm talking birth control, that every woman, every couple who wanted access to birth control in 1973, the Supreme Court ruled birth control must be legal in this country. It's a matter of personal choice. Now, we're being told by some people it ought not to be legal. So the timing of this book is very interesting that way, <laughs> considering the war on women that we hear about out there. Let's get, get to something very, quite topical that you handle in this book, and that is health care. Yes. And now that it's passed through a rather crazy route, but the Supreme, Supreme Court has ruled, and now we know where we're going to sit here, it was really profound to me to read how impactful for women this the ACA is going to be, and now that it's saved, so to speak, for the moment, what this could possibly do for women down the road. Touch on that a little bit, because that, that was a very big deal in, in the middle of this book. Oh, it is, it is. It's very big for women, and just to go back to what we were just talking about, birth control, you know, insurance, ever since Viagra hit the market, has been covering Viagra without copays. Many insurance companies, but not birth control. Where's the fairness in that? So the ACA does guarantee that preventive services, of which birth control is one, mammograms, screening for other kinds of uh, female-related illnesses, those are gonna be covered without copays. Mm -hmm. Something else that most people don't realize, even the women who are being victimized, Many insurance companies do what they call gender rating. Mm. And that means, Gene, if you and I are the same age and we have the same health history and you're male and I'm female, and I, this is not about maternity coverage, that's off the table, uh, but we both go shopping and we buy the exact same insurance policy. I'm going to pay more. Mm. It's legal or has been until the ACA passed, it's no longer gonna be legal. The, and also, they cannot declare that if you are a woman who's had a previous pregnancy or a cesarean section, mm -hmm. that that's a pre-existing condition and you can't get insurance at any price. Mm -hmm. Also, a really outrageous one, is if you have ever been involved in a domestic abuse incident, they call that a pre-existing condition. I did not know that. Yes. Huh. And you cannot get coverage. So that all goes away. All of that sex discrimination goes away. 
The other thing is, most people don't know this, they think that insurance for women costs more because of maternity coverage. Actually, most companies don't offer it at any price. Mm. Now they're going to have to offer it. Of course, you'll have to pay for it. And that's one thing we don't know is what the costs are gonna be for various services, mm -hmm. both women and men. But this law is definitely going to help women, uh, I think more than it will men because men have already been able to get more coverage through work. As I said, they pay less for the same coverage. It's going to level the playing field. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things about the book, again, is, is uh, using that word savvy. Yes. Uh, how to vote, what your vote does or does not do, what your vote does or do, did not do historically in the past. I like the way you laid that out. If only some other people had voted one way or the other, and you brought back that term gender gap. A lot of folks have, you know, let that go by the boards in the last 20 years or so. But you make a very interesting point about how women can be impactful at the polling booth, surely by numbers. So it begs a question, what has happened in your view where women have not asserted what seems to be a, a, a huge tidal wave of numbers to cause effect at, at the voting booth as well as Congress, the White House, and as the case may be. What, is there a disconnect there? What's, what's happening there? Yeah, there's a disconnect, and, okay. and on the part of most voters, really. But what we know, mm -hmm. and it's, it's documentable, and it has not changed since 1980, women have the power to control any election. Mm -hmm. And that's because we are the majority of the population, we're the majority of registered voters, mm -hmm. and we're the majority of people who actually turn out to vote. Right. So that's a triple play, but we have to get together. And part of this b reason for this book is to show women how everything politically affects you as a woman, not only as a citizen, but as a woman. You need to vote your own interest. And, we, and your interests, most of the time, are in line with the interest of your family, or I would say all the time. Uh, take equal pay. Uh, we used to say, uh, people used to say, well, if women make equal pay to men, it's gonna take away from men's wages. Nowadays, families, it's a family issue, and everybody knows if one of the workers is getting shorted by around 22, 25%, that hurts the whole family. So men are in favor of it as much as women. The other thing I do in Your Voice, Your Vote is I give people concrete questions to ask the candidates. And Gene, I have to say, now I am not, uh, I am partisan, fiercely so, for women. So you give me a candidate, I don't care if they're red state, blue state, green, purple, whoever they are, if they're in favor of women and women's rights, I'm gonna back them. And if they're not, I'm not, and I don't care what party label they have. So. That is fundamental. I, I want people to know this is not about vote for so-and-so over so-and-so. Right. It's about ask so-and-so where they stand on this issue or that, and here's how to frame the question. Because we have way too much bumper sticker voting. Mm -hmm. We have people who listen to these platitudes, bromides, uh, this bumper sticker stuff that every candidate, regardless of party, they come out with it. And uh, we go to the polls not really knowing a lot of times the things we should have asked mm -hmm. before we went in. Absolutely, and it was interesting as well, the other part of what you just mentioned about women's clout in the voting booth is women running for office. Yes. And what happens once women do get in an office in appreciable numbers? And it could be Congress, the Senate, and we're not talking about overwhelming numbers here, just small handfuls of women can make a huge difference. Talk to that a little bit, because it seemed to me you were leading up to something very clear about how this is going to change means you gotta get more women in office. This is really oh, the yeah. last frontier oh, yeah. for that. Yeah. You have different priorities as a woman due to your acculturation. I don't care what anybody says. And the women in Congress, many times, most of the time actually, will vote together across party lines on certain issues. Violence against women, health care funding, usually even the abortion issue. Most of the time the Republican women stand with the Democratic women. They did it on the amendment taking abortion out of the ACA. All the women voted against taking it out, regardless of party lines in the House. They lost, why? because there weren't enough of them to begin with. 
So we need a critical mass somewhere around 25% is considered a critical mass. Now let me tell you why it matters. Let's take an issue like gun control. Uh, men look at it differently than women. You say gun control to men, they think hunting. Oh God, I might be called to clean up Dodge. You know, I want my gun. You say gun control to women, they think of getting raped at gunpoint, their kid getting shot at school. It is a whole different mindset. And Gene, I'm not making this up. Polls have shown this. You ask people what they worry about the most vis-a-vis -vis guns and women are going to answer get my kid getting shot at school and men are going to say I want my hunting guns. So we need more women in Congress to kind of temper that debate on certain issues and bring a little bit of a different voice to the table. Mm -hmm. Would it be your, your dream that you would see not just bigger numbers of women but bigger numbers of women on both sides of the spectrum as well, not necessarily just more liberal or left leaning women, but all women? Because as you're saying, a lot of conservative women do vote along with, you know, not so conservative women. Does, does that matter to you at all? Does it have to be more? Yeah, it does okay. matter to okay. me. I have to say, I don't want, and I'm going to name names, I do not want a Congress full of Sarah Palin's and Michelle Bachman's. They don't vote the, uh, the interests of most people, in my view, uh, much less women. Uh, I'm a liberal. I think that's no secret. Uh, and so in my dreams, you know, we would have a very liberal, caring, humane Congress. I think overall, I'd love to see gender balance in the Congress. I'd like to see feminist balance, meaning feminist men as well as women. I mean, take somebody like Vice President Biden. Uh, if it had not been for him, we wouldn't have a Violence Against Women Act right now because he spearheaded it back in the 90s. He carried it in the Senate when it looked like it was never going to pass. So I count him as the kind of man I would like to see as well. But uh, no, I wouldn't go so far as to say any woman will do. There you go. What, what's the future for women in politics, locally, nationally, internationally? You point out internationally, there's you know a lot of momentum for women internationally. We're way behind the rest of the world when it comes to heads of state. Oh yeah. It just doesn't matter. We're not even on the same lap. It's just not even close. So where do we need to go from here in your view for women to get really power equity, gender equity in our Congress, in our state legislators? What, what happens I'm going to say a word people don't like to hear and that's quotas. I just got back from Macedonia, not uh, a real, real advanced country because they've only been out from under communism for 20 years, mm -hmm. but they have a 30% quota for women in parliament and they have 30% of women in parliament. We have 17% of women in the United States Congress. We're 69th in the world in terms of gender parity in our governing bodies. Mm -hmm. And if you look at advanced democracies, Norway, uh, much of the EU, there are quotas. Now, people think that's a bad word. Mm -hmm. And what I say is, no, we already got quotas. Yeah. They're just not written down. And they are keeping not only women, men of color, uh, other people who have traditionally been marginalized, these are quotas. Mm -hmm. They're, they're just not written down anywhere. You, you think about corporate boards. Sure. Uh, there's a woman's seat, or maybe two, if we're really lucky. <laughs> Interesting. Martha Burke, thank you so much. Great book. Your Voice, Your Vote, The Savvy Woman's Guide to Power, Politics, and the Change We Need. Thanks for coming in. Gee, thanks for having me. Absolutely.